So I'm on Facebook Marketplace just casually browsing for something fun to ruin my weekend with, and up pops this glorious little Taito Space Invaders cabaret machine for $450, which is already tempting because I've paid more for sandwiches. But then my buddy Gary from Friendswood, Texas, which sounds fake but is very real, says he'll let it go for a cool $400 because Gary's a gentleman. A gentleman with tastefully discounted arcade machines. This thing was apparently picked up during what I can only describe as an arcade warehouse raid in Mississippi several years ago. Yes, Mississippi. And how do we know it's legit because it still has tax stickers from 1982 stuck to the side like it's a forgotten blockbuster employee? Incredible. So I hop into my Marty McFly-themed Toyota truck. What makes it Marty McFly-themed, you ask? A bumper sticker that says, My other ride is a DeLorean and a Statler Toyota license plate frame. That's it. I'm now flying down the highway at roughly 500 miles per hour, and in what feels like 15 seconds later, I arrive at Gary's house. Gary, by the way, isn't home. But don't worry, he told me the machine would be under the carport and I could pay him in the usual manner. And what is the usual manner, you ask? Why, it's leaving $400 in cash under a rock. That's how crimes start, Gary. The machine fit perfectly into the back seat of my truck because it's one of the smaller trimline models, which is arcade code for fun-sized. These were compact versions of the bigger cabinets designed for people who wanted the same gameplay experience without, you know, needing a forklift. Taito made a bunch of these little guys in the early 80s until one day they released Jungle King, renamed it Jungle Hunt, and then said, you know what, no more small cabinets. That was fun. We're done. We're finally home with our newly acquired yet non-working treasure. Oh, did I forget to mention it wasn't working? Because, of course, it's not working. I love getting broken machines. This has been documented because when you finally fix it, after hours of swearing and three to four emotional breakdowns, you get to experience something rare in this life. A brief, fleeting sense of accomplishment. And I live for that feeling. I chase that feeling like it owes me money. I immediately place the machine on a rolling wooden dolly because I treat vintage arcade cabinets with the same reverence people usually reserve for antique violins or bomb squad equipment. Why? Because water is the enemy! Most arcade cabinets are made of particle board, which is a material that should never have been invented. It soaks up water like it's auditioning to be a sponge, and then it expands like it has opinions. Now, included with this glorious corpse of a game was a brand new joystick stick. Yes, joystick stick, because I say it like that now. And some fresh buttons to liven up the control panel while still keeping those vintage vibes. It's still 50% original, which should reduce the crying from purists to a manageable level. Oh, we even got identical replacement switches in case the old ones are acting wonky, which is technical repair language for possessed. Also, the coin box is missing, but that's fine. We're not here to make money. We're here for free play and personal validation. We start inspecting the boards and the power supply, and miraculously, it's all there. Nothing appears to be missing, which is suspicious, like eerily suspicious. This machine has clearly seen some things. I mean, there's Mississippi tax stickers on it dating back to the 1980s. That means this thing could have at some point been in the same room as Faith Hill, James Earl Jones, or even Oprah Winfrey. Do I think that happened? No, absolutely not. This machine was more likely kept in a Pizza Hut break room next to a mop sink. But technically, technically, it's possible, maybe. Let's begin by reaching into the coin door, which yes, feels as sketchy as it sounds and grabbing the back door key from its hidden little metal goblin cave. It's usually clipped right at the back of the coin door because arcade operators in the 1980s were clever, resourceful, and always one Mountain Dew away from going fully postal. But somehow, they managed to channel that chaos into hiding keys inside machines like it was a spy drop in East Berlin. Now this key unlocks the back panel, which is our gateway into the mystical forbidden zone, also known as the inside of the cabinet. Here, we hope to spot something obviously broken, like a cable flailing loose or a wire that's been chewed through by an animal or possibly a demon. I don't see anything obvious yet, which is shocking, considering this machine's older than the internet and was last powered on when people still use the word gnarly. What I do find on the bottom of the cabinet is the set of replacement button switches I mentioned earlier, which is good because I also find a broken one that looks like it fought in a war and lost. So yes, we'll be needing those. 
Now it's time to bust out our fluke voltmeter, which is my most trusted companion in the field of amateur electrocution avoidance. I set it to beep mode because that's how most arcade repair is done, not with knowledge or schematics, but with hope and a tiny beep. If it beeps, the fuse is good. If it doesn't beep, the fuse is bad. If the fuse has a giant black scorch mark on it, like it saw something it wasn't supposed to, that's also probably bad. After some poking and gentle electrical whispers, I discover the 12 volt fuse on the classic linear power supply is blown. Could this be it? Could this one little glass tube be the reason this entire 1980s alien war machine doesn't work? Maybe. Could replacing it solve everything? It could. But also, no. Don't quote me on that. These machines, these cabinets, these vintage arcade relics, they have a sick sense of humor. They like to lure you in with one broken fuse and then... Just when you think everything's fine, they hit you with emotional sabotage, physical discomfort, and if you're working near the high voltage CRT monitor, the possibility of a brief but meaningful conversation with your ancestors. So yeah, we're going to replace the fuse. We have spare fuses because why wouldn't we? I collect them the way some people collect vinyl records, so I grab one, an exact match, run back to the machine like I'm in a 1980s hacker movie, and pop that little guy in. But wait! Before we hit the power, I noticed something important. The power cord is missing its ground plug. Just gone. And that's because back in the day, arcade operators would just snap those things off like Pringles if the dive bar or unlicensed bowling alley they were wiring into didn't have grounded outlets. And you're like, isn't that dangerous? And they're like, uh, yes, and also I smoke indoors. So we do a little video editing magic, very David Copperfield, very low budget exorcism, and boom, we graft a new plug onto that cursed cord like some kind of Frankenstein power cable. Now if the fuse blows again, we know it's not the plug, it's probably the ghost. Okay, we flip the power switch. Cue dramatic music. Is anything happening? Is it? Uh, no, seriously, is it? I'm staring at this monitor like I'm waiting for it to whisper, get out, in a deep demonic voice. Nothing. So we check the fuse and, yup, it's blown. It's got that tiny burn mark that says something inside this cabinet screamed and died. So, not the plug. Probably the linear power supply. Classic. These things are like the Ghostbusters containment unit, but instead of catching ghosts, they release them straight into your wiring. Luckily, there's a solution, ArcadeShop.com, which is like Amazon, but for arcade-specific shenanigans. They sell a little adapter that lets us use a modern switching power supply, which is like replacing a haunted fireplace with a plug-in space heater. And guess what? In no time at all, bam, the box arrives. Because of course, I bought another thing. I'm always buying things. If I stop buying things, the arcade spirits start talking to me again. First out of the box, an Atari Quantum Replica PCB, which has nothing to do with this project, but we're gonna install it eventually in a different video when we are emotionally prepared to open that can of vector-based worms. But the real star of the show is this tiny little adapter that says, I will fix your 1980s trauma for 1999 plus shipping. Now here's the thing. We already have switching power supplies on hand. Why? Because we own a jillion arcade games, which means power supplies burn out around here like light bulbs on a Christmas tree. Here we are examining a switching power supply, which if you're not familiar, is a small metal box that outputs several different DC voltages, and it does so through a delightful little row of screws, like actual screws, as in do not lose these or the machine gets it. Each of these screws is labeled with voltages like plus 5, plus 12, negative 5, which sounds less like a power supply and more like the emotional range of someone who just got ghosted at a radio shack. Now let's take a closer look at the adapter, which has teeth. Literal tiny metal teeth like it was designed by a vengeful dentist. These little claws are going to line up perfectly with the screw terminals, and when you screw them down, it forms a connection that I can only describe as technological chicken jockeying. And if you haven't seen the Minecraft movie, you really should. Now here's the fun part. It also needs AC power to work, because of course it does. This thing doesn't run on hope and good intentions, so we will now perform the delicate and ancient ritual of jamming live power into a small angry box and pretending like we're totally qualified to do that. Where we're going to take these simple tools and correctly color-coded wires so we can build a wire harness for the switcher using the same style Molex plug as the linear power supply. That way this will be super easily reversible if we want to go back to the old linear power supply because you never know, you know? 
Now that looks fantastic if I do say so myself, which I just did. We even added a green ground wire to complete the circle of life or something. So, hey, let's stop making harnesses and quoting the Lion King and plug this thing into the Space Invaders. With the flip of a switch, there's power coursing through the veins of our vintage machine, but is it working? Absolutely not, as clearly evidenced by our PCB, which is now releasing into the air what we in the electronics repair biz call the magic smoke. When you let the magic smoke out of the chips, they don't work anymore, so this is bad. Going back to our footage, it looks like we have a screenshot of the fire. <coughs> yes, that was the actual voice the PCB made. After a brief review of the entire board, we soon identify this tantalum capacitor right by the CPU. This is the guy that was smoking in the boys' room, guys. We got to replace this. So what's going to happen? A trip to Ace Electronics, my favorite place. And we're going to bring home a whole baggie full of tantalum capacitors because why buy one when you can buy six or seven? I don't know. Okay, so tantalum capacitor has now been installed. Flipping on the power. Take three. Let's see. Ooh, that's a cool sound, right? Um, that's Oh, look, we've got stuff's happening. There's the game. Oh, this is awesome. All right. Let's can we play a game? I can't just hit start. Let's go ahead and coin up down here and we're going to start a game and let's see how it's going. I've never done it. We've never played it. And oh, okay, we're going to do this. Doesn't look like going left works, so we can fix that. And I uh, I'm not hearing the pew pew sounds, but I let me see here. This is really kind of interesting. Okay, when I shoot the ships I can hear that all right so we've got things to do we've got we've got goals everybody okay we're gonna wrap up part one if you like my content and want to keep up with the future updates hit that subscribe button and please leave a like if you enjoyed the video thanks for watching Woo!